So good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the IACT IMDHA Presenter Series. We are gearing up for the Great Hypno Expo 2020, coming to Orlando on April 24th through the 26th. So uh, we're looking forward to that conference. Uh, before and after those dates, there are pre- and post-conference programs. And in this series, what we've been doing is interviewing the people who are presenting those pre- and post-conference programs. Uh, 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 so the general lineup for tonight is we're going to be talking with uh, Patty Scott and Eric Rosen about their medical hypnosis program for the first half of the program. And then we'll be talking with uh, Dr. Will Horton about an NLP program that he's offering uh, as a, uh, a post-conference program. And um, that's, uh, that's the general plan for tonight. But uh, we want you to know just a couple of things. So uh, Karen, give them the rundown of what they, sure. what can they get, Karen? You get CEUs for being here. All you have to do is go claim your CEUs from IAC or IMDHA, and many other friendly organizations also will give you CEUs for being here, so claim away. Uh, next week, we'll be here with Sheila Granger, the successful hypnopreneur's business and marketing operating system, and Sherry Gilbert, talking about smoking cessation for groups. So, you know, this just keeps rolling along and rolling along, but we have a very exciting lineup tonight. So... Michael, I think maybe we are ready. I think we are ready. So, in fact, I would like to begin by introducing my friend, uh, Patricia Scott. And, you know, there's this, there's this formal introduction here about Patricia. She's a certified medical hypnotherapist since 1992. Uh, she's a certified master trainer for IAC. She's a life fellow with the IMDHA. She's president of the Up Hypnosis Institute. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, she is now the vice president of the Hypnosis Education Association. Uh, she's here in Florida where she maintains a private practice and she teaches hypnosis and medical hypnotherapy and NLP. And prior to that, she had an acting career of 20 years as a professional singer, actor, dancer, and songwriter. So, uh, and, but besides all of that, she's just one heck of a great lady. She's a lovely, lovely friend of mine. And so, uh, Patty, welcome to the show. Hey, let me just say, besides the, the thing that you are doing with Eric, you also have a one hour that I'm really intrigued with. Can we just split off for one second, Michael, and talk about this for one hour? Sure. Hey, the, uh, it's, it's pretty exciting about being the expert in your field. Tell me a little bit about that, if you would. Oh, okay. I was expecting that. So that, I love to live on the fly as my <laughs> Become a local hypnotist expert. Uh, yeah, uh, because and, and the reason that it, this is one of the things I like to teach people in hypnosis training, because way back in 1992, you know, I got trained by uh, the wonderful Dr. Al Krasner, and then they threw, threw us out in the world, you know, and we're all like, now what do we do? And try to figure it out. So for the, for the first few years of my career in California, I was trying to figure it out. And, you know, it, it was kind of slow moving and hit and miss. And by the time I moved to Florida, about 11, 12 years later, whatever it was, um, I had learned a lot about what not to do. <laughs> and I had learned what works. So when I got here, it took me six months, literally. Um, I, I use that number because I do remember within about six months, I was the hypnotist in the area. So I put, to, I put together some things that I did that I had learned. This is not about online stuff, so they can learn that from those experts. This is about in-person, one-on-one, and how to, how to interact with your local community to become the expert. And some of the things I did cost a little bit of money, but a lot of them were, were basically I learned how to do that really were either very inexpensive or free. And they, they were very good at getting me known in the community as the expert. Free always draws our attention. And you can learn about that in Patty's free one, free one hour <laughs> on, uh, <laughs> on Sunday at 10 a.m. Right? That's really cool. And of course, your, your workshop is with Eric. And so let me just introduce Eric real quick, and then we'll get to that. Eric Rosen holds a PhD from the State University of New York at Buffalo in counseling psychology, and is both a licensed psychologist in New York and Florida holding practice with family psychology, uh, psychology, sorry, with family psychological services of Palm Harbor Incorporated. Maybe easier for Eric to say than me. We'll test him on that coming up. Providing psychology, psychological testing, forensic work, and clinical hypnotherapy for children, adolescents, adults, and families. Eric is also an associate professor with the Florida School of Professional Psychology at Argosy University, Tampa, an APA accredited school. Woohoo! 
So Eric, welcome, both you and Thank Peg. You. And, and Eric, by the way, also has a one hour that uh, we're, we're just charging right in here, Eric. So, so I hope you're, hope you're ready for us. Uh, a one hour on a topic that keeps coming up around me in the last, uh, in the last couple of months or so. This is, a, this is really some hot stuff, uh, uh, trauma-informed hypnotherapy. So as I said to you, Eric, we, you know, we don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but I wonder if you could just kind of give us a synopsis about what is trauma-informed hypnotherapy for people who don't know and, uh, and tell us about that. Sure. Well, it's um, very much in vogue. It has to do with identifying people that need help that are dealing with trauma. And they call that field trauma-informed care. So what I have done is put together a workshop that looks at how to help people that may be dealing with some elements of trauma. And for many hypnotherapists, and uh, whether you're certified or licensed, it doesn't matter, you're going to find people that are coming in dealing with insomnia and panic attacks and heightened startle response and nightmares, and, and that all fits with trauma. So we're going to roll up our sleeves, learn about some of the models and the techniques that can help these people. Wow. Very so cool. Great stuff. That's going to be exciting. So uh, then now we are here, of course, to talk about the medical hypnotherapy program that, uh, that Patty and Scott are both doing together. So I'm just going to put out the first, the first question here. I don't know. Uh, uh, between the two of you, you can arm wrestle or whatever you need to do uh, to, decide, to decide who this question is best for. But just first of all, just who is your workshop uh, designed for? Who's the ideal person to take your, your workshop? Well, I'll start off, I guess, and then we can let Eric answer as well. But it's basically the two day that we're do offering on the 22nd and 23rd, the, the pre-conference, uh, the Wednesday and Thursday, is designed for people who are already trained in hypnosis. So we're not going to like teach people the very basics. So it's it, they have to be familiar with the basics of hypnosis, obviously. And that are and anybody that's interested in working with the more uh, medical or clinical side of the of the process of hypnosis, which you know, in my opinion, is always affected anyway when people come in, and to uh, work with doctors' referrals, which can also be a great referral source to build a practice. So that's uh, basically what that's for. And then we do have an optional post-conference, um, not at the conference, but separate completely. Uh, if people want to get certified through IMDHA, it requires a few more uh, hours. So they will have an option to take a, a very reasonable online training after the conference so that if they're out of the area, they can finish up there and become certified through IMDHA. But they will get a certificate of completion for two days of specialty training in medical hypnotherapy after the two days. It'll be very comprehensive just in and of itself. Would you just explain to me what medical hypnotherapy is? I mean, are we talking about IBS, fibromyalgia, cancer, pain, the whole gamut, migraines? What do we, what, put a frame around that for me, if you would. I would say yes. I would say yes to all of that, and the reason is because uh, many people, probably the, the majority of folks, at some point or other, are going to be dealing with some medical issue, and it can be any of the things that you've mentioned, from pain issues to uh, fibromyalgia to MS to cancer to um, urinary problems, skin problems, and a lot of times when people are in need, uh, hypnotherapy can be a powerful tool for helping people to deal with any of the symptoms, to reduce some of the, the acuity of symptoms, to help them to feel less discomfort. Uh, and, and another larger issue that we'll talk about in the conference also comes from health psychology. It has to do with the meaning that we give to the different medical and physical problems that we have. And so being able to understand that help us to what I call look at the hypnotic targets. What are some of the ways that you can help people to reduce some of the discomfort they have, to feel more empowered to deal with their health issues? So it sounds like what we're all doing is a little bit of this, but this is directly targeted to specific issues. Did I get that right? Yes, it's to um, create the mindset to help people to actually apply the tools. And that way, it also can help your marketing. So that way, you can reach out to other providers, to other people in the medical field, and be able to offer some of what hypnosis can be a help with. 
again, we're not intruding on what the medical field does. We're actually creating a complementary integrative service. And in fact, if you go online, you will find that the Mayo Clinic actually makes use and touts hypnotherapy as one of their integrative complementary services. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense for us as a profession to be able to offer the skills we have in these areas. Nice, nice. In fact, Mayo, as, as I understand it, has been involved with hypnosis for a long, a long, long time, which is a, a pretty cool thing. So, so I'm curious, and I, I kind of like to humanize all this. It always helps me get a sense of who it is that I'm working with. And, and so I, I'm wondering what it is that, uh, that got both of you interested in doing medical hypnotherapy in the first place. Well, I'll go ahead and start, I guess, because uh, I got into hypnosis many, many years before I became a hypnotist. Um, didn't know I was going to be a hypnotist for all those years I was in show business. And I used it uh, because when I was 19, I had a back injury. And I started uh, getting some intuitive, if you will, uh, inner signals that what the road the doctors were going to send me on wasn't one that was going to be right for me without having any, uh, any evidence of, as to why that was accurate. And I trusted those instincts. And for the next many years, I recovered from the back injury, uh, which wasn't supposed to be possible on my own without surgeries and et cetera. And then I started using it for a myriad of other things during my years in uh, the entertainment field and fixing a lot of uh, curing and fixing and staying healthy and controlling weight and a bunch of things. So I think a lot of people come to this field kind of the way I did, having done something uh, either intuitively or by reading some books on mind body type therapies and wanting to learn more about it. So that's really what brought me to, and my first hypnosis training, uh, immediately I went to Arizona and started studying the medical and I just got hooked immediately because it is, uh, the tools are pretty much very similar, but it is directing them as uh, Eric said, and, and definitely working with doctors as a partner, as, as a team, part of that team. And, to, and again, our goal is to help there be more people out there comfortable with working with medical hypnotherapy so that they can become part of a team in a clinic or in a doctor's office or in a medical facility or a hospital. And that's part of what we're hoping to do too, is just spread that, that good word and let people feel more comfortable knowing they have those skills. And, and I would uh, say that in working with Patty, um, what we discovered even in our trainings and, and teaching hypnosis is that we encounter people that are coming in typically for one type of help and then we discover that they are dealing with IBS or they have an impending surgery coming up or they have some pain issues. And to be able to expand how we can help people, it becomes a smorgasbord, a menu of all these different ways that we can apply our services, which as a practice opens up the, the audiences that you can help. It also allows you to be able to reach out to other medical providers to help. And in our workshop, we'll also go into countless examples of how you can apply these. I'll give you one. I was working with a fella who came in, was having impending surgery coming up and was having a lot of anxiety and fear about it. So we did some hypnosis and some future pacing to help them to be able to face the surgery with confidence. And we know from the research that when people are more relaxed and calm, they actually heal faster their experience of coming with the surgery and recovery can be so much more pleasant. So I did that and then also did some uh, hypnotherapy with some pain they were having, used a technique that you will learn in the course having to do with calibration. And when the person walked in, they actually were limping into the session with a cane, sat on the couch, we did the hypnotherapy induction and the techniques. And when they were done, they stood up and actually the fella started like pushing his leg vigorously on the floor going, this is supposed to hurt. And so he said, it doesn't hurt. And I said, well, that is miraculous. That is fantastic. And so what was most fascinating was a week later, the primary care doctor called my office asking for more cards. And the reason is because What's happening in the field with opiates is that there's been a real movement and recognition that with the opiate addictions, that primary care docs are not, and other pain specialists, they're not relying as much on pain medication to that extent. 
And so we have a ripe, wonderful opportunity as a profession to step in and offer what we do. Nice, nice. So, so Patty mentioned earlier that, um, that uh, people had to have, of course, a basic understanding of hypnosis already, that you're not, that, that you're not teaching a hypnosis course. But I, I guess I'm wondering, is there any other, any, any particular level of training or any amount of experience? Should they be somebody that's kind of seasoned in hypnosis or? Uh, uh, not for the, two, not really for the two day, because uh, the two day training, they just need to have a basic knowledge and understanding of hypnosis. Of course, it's helpful if they have some experience, but that particular specialty, when I started my medical training, uh, and one of the reasons I thought this was appropriate is because I, did, I only had a very basic course in hypnosis, and I was able to grasp the fact that I could expand it into the medical issues. Right. And so it, it, for that, and now for the certification, it, since it is through IMDHA, it is required that they have at least a 200-hour training right. uh, you know, in, with an appropriate organization, hopefully IMDHA or IACT. And um, so that's, that's what's required for the certification. But to do the two-day uh, Wednesday and Thursday class, as long as they have the rudimentaries and they can follow along with basic hypnosis language, they, they will be fine. They, they will be able to follow just fine. Great, great. Eddie, will, will you also cover, I know that you, your one hour is, is marketing, and Eric mentioned that you'll talk about some marketing and working with doctors. It's good marketing. But will you also address some of the issues? I know a lot of hypnotists who are really touchy about touching anything medical without a doctor's referral, without you know working with a doctor. Will you also touch on those parameters, how to get a doctor's referral and how to work with those doctors? Absolutely, because it is required in most, I, be, I believe all states and most countries, because we will be some, sometimes we're dealing with people. Last year, I had people from Hong Kong and Australia and places. So I always encourage them to check with their local, you know, rules and laws or, or check with IACT and IMDHA. I'm sure keeps track of all of these things as well, can be a good source for that. Um, in Florida, I'm very well versed in Florida law and I was in California. It's pretty much the same there. In most states here, you want to have a doctor's referral and frankly, even if I didn't require a referral from a doctor, I would still enjoy getting it because when you help some, one of their patients with a problem they're having, you're making the doctor's job easier. And that will only help you to get more referrals from that doctor. So let's say for a weight loss or weight management, they like to call it, or weight control, generally we don't need from the state of Florida or most states in America, a referral from a doctor. Now, if it's obesity, that's a clinical diagnosis, <laughs> Uh, actually, <laughs> and you know we don't diagnose or prescribe uh, anything, so we I, we would get a referral for that. But again, if I'm working with weight loss, generally people that have had chronic weight problems, which is usually they don't come because it started last week to a hypnotist, and they're going to have a problem that's got some history. Uh, usually, they're going to have some other health issues, obviously that are uh, that that weight is affecting has been affecting through the years. So it really uh, behooves us to get that referral so that we can then connect with the doctor and interact with them and say, you know, I just uh, found out from your patient, your patient, it's our client, unless we're a medical doctor or we're licensed to call them patients. And that, you know, I just found out that they're also having problems with uh, diabetes or with pain in their joints or with sleeping or some other issues that might require referral. And so that way I can interact with them even more easily and, and get the referral to expand what I'm doing with them. And that makes the doctor very happy because our job is to educate the medical profession maybe doesn't even realize in most cases that a hypnotherapist can help with these types of things, these peripheral nice. issues as well. Nice. That's and, a great take, a great takeaway. Are there other things that people will take away from your workshop? Well, I think one of the things to piggyback on what uh, Patty was mentioning is that we also do get into something called the scope of practice, meaning that we also talk about what is ethical uh, in terms of offering some of the services around medical issues. In other words, an example would be that we cannot guarantee or uh, create a promise to people that we will get them off a of medication. In other words, one of the, even for myself as a licensed uh, psychologist, I have to be mindful of what those boundaries are. So we do get into some of those areas, both for the certified hypnotherapists and for licensed people. And how do you go about making use of these services while operating what you call scope of practice? Cool. Yeah, very cool. 
<laughs> so. I guess I guess I was wondering also if there is or will be specific techniques that are recommended that you say go down this path? Will you talk about storytelling? Will you talk about metaphor? Absolutely, absolutely. Last year was the first year I presented this at, um, at the conference. Unfortunately, Eric had a family emergency and wasn't able to join me, but we had some amazing uh, experiences during the processes in that training. And there was one gentleman actually that had uh, I didn't know it at the time until we started doing the exercise. He had a headache, a very, very bad headache that he, he said he had had it all day, right? And this was uh, later in the day that he told us this because we were doing this exercise after lunch, I think it was. And we were practicing a, a pain relief exercise. And uh, I walked up while the two people were practicing and kind of stepped in because he mentioned he really did have a terrible headache was having trouble focusing and we did a little five minute process and I got to tell you that was the best advertisement for the training right there because uh, evidently he didn't train with me uh, originally none of the people had actually and um, in his original training they hadn't really covered some of these even simpler pain relief type processes and he at the end of the little five minutes looked at me and he said that was absolutely amazing and he he was just blown away that his his headache was gone. And I talked to him later and he said, that's just, he was just blown away. And so even people who've been trained, I'm finding out from other organizations don't sometimes cover some of the things that I take for granted because they were covered in, in my trainings and in the, the ones that I give in, in my uh, institute here. And so I, we don't want to take that for granted. And sometimes the simplest processes, and again, because it's a two day training, we're not going to do extensive, but we cover things, how, how parts therapy timeline, uh, techniques, regression, um, the different techniques, the library technique, which is one of my favorites that I learned uh, many years ago, all, how all these can be adapted because they all include elements of most of the techniques that most people are familiar with, at least the elements of them. And it's more about the direction you want to take the session and, and how to then apply it directly. And definitely metaphors, storytelling is phenomenal for a lot of health issues. Because well, we're living in that like all the time anyway, right? It's right. all the story we're telling ourselves, and we just help them to change the story they're telling themselves. Absolutely. And storytelling is also a great way to sell a workshop. So I'll bet you both have a success story that you're willing to share with us about how you've used medical hypnotherapy <laughs> to create a miraculous success. How much time do we have left? <laughs> Besides my back injury, I, I keep forgetting to mention this, but I, I have to show up for the last 20 something years I've been using no anesthesia whatsoever for all of my medical, uh, my dental uh, processes. Started out with things like fillings and crowns. And most recently, in about a year and a half ago, I had oral surgery, which the anesthesiologist told, the anesthesiologist told me I would not be able to use hypnosis uh, because it would uh, interfere with the controlling the blood flow, which I knew was baloney. So I fired him and had my dentist refer me to another one. And I went through an entire oral surgery in the top front of my mouth, all the way across, two bone grafts in the top of my mouth, and then seven crowns, several sessions with the dentist, plus the oral surgery and all the follow-up, zero anesthesia. And I'll bring the letter that the anesthesiologist wrote to my dentist about how he has new faith in his blood pressure and in hypnotherapy. <laughs> and that's yeah. it that I fixed my eyesight with hypnosis, I could go on and on and on about what I've used it for personally. And I believe in walking the walk. So, you know, a lot of hypnotists don't, don't they forget that they know how to do this for themselves, you know? Right. How about you, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I actually had a referral from my primary care doctor on uh, an individual who was dealing with a second round of cancer after many years. And with the cancer, the individual had lost their sense of taste. And for most of us, taste and smell is really how we connect through our senses with foods and sure. so forth. So that can actually affect your appetite. You can have weight loss and it can actually also be associated with depression. So I actually did hypnosis with the individual and was able to, after one session, that person uh, I said to him, what, what would you, if you could, at the end of our session today, have some taste or experience that you could go home and then start to enjoy whatever that food was. And they said, well, it was a peanut butter sandwich with jelly on fresh bread. And so I used the hypnosis to bring up 
some of those strong ingrained memories that we have of food and taste. And during the session, they actually were able to experience the sense of taste for that. And they didn't, it was all in their mind. They went home and they had a, a peanut butter sandwich on fresh bread. So they were able to start to eat again. Wow. So make me hungry, Eric. <laughs> I know. That's cool. Power yeah. of the mind. I, I was just thinking, I, I, somebody told me once that I had no taste. I'm thinking maybe I should come to you for a session. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll make sure not to leave a bad taste in your mouth. There you go. There you go. Yeah, so, so, what a, so, so this is a wide, wide range of, of issues that, uh, you know, that can be treated using medical hypnosis. And that's, uh, that's the, the lovely thing about this. So people that are considering your, you know, your program, I want them to really keep in mind the, the, the breadth of what becomes available as they step through. I mean, I, I, I don't know how to say this. Uh, metaphorically, I'm thinking that your workshop is a doorway into that domain that, uh, you know, that, that people can, uh, can venture further out once they've, uh, once they've done that. So I can't help but ask this of Patty, because I've, I've got to know, do you have something special? Are you an exceptional hypnotist that you were able to do this for yourself? Or can this be taught? I mean, can just regular people who walk in, because I don't want people going into their dentist and saying, oh no, just do me, I'll use my mind. <laughs> it's something that they have to be taught, right? <laughs> I never try to talk anybody into doing anything without anesthesia, first of all. I am a trainer, so I felt the obligation, even before I became a trainer, I, had, I was a hypnotherapist and I thought, you know, I know these techniques, I know other people have used them and they work. So I felt, like I needed to be doing them. It's, it's a great way to practice. We're our own guinea pig. And here, here's the other thing. Every hypnotist, anybody who has a desire to do this work and that has some decent training can definitely learn how to do all of these things. And if they aren't doing it for themselves, and, and I just wanted to mention our, our training, I'm kind of glad now that it's at the beginning of the, of the weekend because I am a lifetime student. We are always evolving. You know, we're, I've been doing this for 28 years and I'm, I'm still feel like I've got so much to learn. I got to live at least to 230, you know, just to get old. <laughs> but, you know, going to these conferences every year is part of why I feel comfortable with all these things. And, you know, these conferences are amazing to interact with people like Michael Watson and Karen Hand and Will Horton and Dan Cleary and all these amazing people that have been on these calls and so many more and new ones that I'm meeting every year. So to be able to interact in between sessions and after hours, which of course is my favorite, don't mm -hmm. tell anybody, don't tell anybody, but you know, <laughs> and, and you learn so much during the day, but then you get to pick people's brains in the evening. Hypnotists love to talk about what they do. So mm -hmm. I always, since I started, have taken advantage of that. When I realized they love to talk about it, I was learning a lot during the after hours. And so to me, that's, uh, you know, you can take this stuff online, but when you're there, to me, it's like quadruple or 10 times more educational, just being around the people and interacting and hearing these stories that you don't have time to give maybe in a 45 minute lecture or a two day training. But you know? by the way, there is something I'd like to clear up. Uh, and, and that is that uh, as, as Patty said, anybody can learn to do these things. Yes. And, but the thing that I want to clear up is, and she is an exceptional hypnotherapist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, so I, I'm, I'm just curious as, uh, and by the way, I, I just might mention uh, that we've got uh, uh, about 12 minutes left altogether before it's time to introduce Will. So if anybody that's, uh, that's listening has any questions or anything like that, uh, you can just write in the chat box for one thing. That would be one option. Or you can, uh, or you could even put a question mark in the chat box, and then we'll know that you have a question, and we'll open up your microphone. That would be another way to do it. Or you can wave wildly uh, as long as your camera is on, and uh, we'll probably see you doing that, and we'll know that you have a question. But uh, in the meantime, uh, I just want to uh, to ask uh, uh, ask about the future. Uh, what do you think is the future of medical hypnotherapy? Where is this all headed? Eric, you want to? Well, it. I think th there's a, a growing recognition that um, people are also becoming more empowered as active participants in their own wellness. And hypnosis is a beautiful technique because as we're trained, all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. And what I do is I help people to learn how to do it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And basically people then, they, 
they don't have to be afraid of the process. I would even say for people attending our workshop, do not be afraid of learning and stepping into using this because I think it will help others and expand your practice. Oh my goodness, I think people ought to know how to do this stuff even if they don't intend to do medical hypnotherapy. Because just as Patty said before, she was in a workshop where a guy had a headache. Well, if you've got a client who walks in and they have trouble focusing or being in the session because they've got a headache, how nice is it to have a technique that you can help them with that? Testing first so they don't have a brain tumor, we know, I get it. <laughs> but I'm just saying. Well, we have a referral. <laughs> right, but how nice is it to help somebody do that? Just as we would help somebody relax if they come in stressed out from traffic, right? Yeah. It's just using right. our tools well, to take advantage. And that's, and that's the bottom line. When I first uh, went to my first medical hypnosis training, it was with my ex-husband who had lymphoma. And the reason I went was just to support him. I fell madly in love with it immediately, not knowing that I was even qualified to learn that stuff. And I learned very quickly, yes, it, you know, that, that it is applicable and you can learn it. As long as you have a desire to help people, you can do these things. And again, we know that the, whether it's a medical, um, you know, what they call physical, emotional, are energetic, you know, for the energy field thing, people. It, 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 everything affects everything else. So somebody comes in to us. I had a guy who came in one time to quit smoking. And he quit smoking. And then I saw him, gosh, it must have been a few months later, he came to a class. And when he came to my class, uh, I found out, he, he came up to me and he said, I did great. You know, I haven't even thought about smoking. And all of a sudden he says, he says, you know, there was something else that I didn't expect that I got from, from that coming to you to quit smoking. I said, what was that? He said, I, I, before I came to you, I was having migraine headaches, like at least two or three times a week for years. He'd been having them. And he said, and he didn't tell me that during the session. You know, I think I do a pretty good intake, but it didn't come up. And he said, I haven't had migraine headaches since I came and quit smoking with you. And then, of course, I'm thinking if he tells his doctor, it'll say he'll say it's because you quit smoking that you're not having the migraines. But right. uh, we, you know, but we know that everything does affect everything else. So there's that nice ripple effect we always talk about with hypnosis. We're dealing with the presenting issue that the client brings in because I always tell my students it's not our job to tell someone that comes in to quit smoking that they need to lose 50 pounds. You know, please don't do that. I tell them, you know, our job is not to give advice to our clients. It's to help them as long as we're ethically and morally okay with what they're asking us to help them with. We should stay tuned in to what they say they want. And then with the knowing inside of us that it, it's going to be that ripple effect. Everything starts affecting the other things because to change themselves, which is what's nice about what hypnosis does, is goes on the person's inside. We encourage out of that person their own resources. It's very empowering instead of the usual medical model, which is something's wrong with you. We're going to fix it and do something to you or give you something or inject something or put something into your body. It's the opposite. We reach inside of them and pull it out from their own resources, which is very empowering. And then they have it for everything else in their life from then on, should they choose to use it. Again, your mission is if you should choose to accept it is to use this now, you know, and that's why I say for hypnotists, use the skills you have because caregivers sometimes are the are the ones that need the help the most you know people that care a lot about other people tend to neglect themselves sometimes and we can help those caregivers as well so well, they're the ones who could really use it because they're in a place where they can use it if you're a caregiver right. what a great what a great modality to add i remember patty when my mother was in the last year of her life there was a nurse who came once a week to take her blood and there was a time she came to draw blood and my mother sat in a chair and gripped the side of the chair and said, she's going to take all of my blood. I won't have any left. Uh -huh. And she, the nurse put, put the needle in the vein, no blood. She pulled it out thinking she'd made a mistake. She went to the other arm, no blood. Wow. It was just a little, little, little drop, a little bit of bread. So we knew that the blood had been, the vein had been tapped no blood. And I realized, oh my God, I just heard her say she's going to take all of my blood. I won't have any left. And I grabbed my mother's hand and said, breathe with me. Now, breathe on this count. And I just did a real simple box breathing with her, but it was, you know, it was kind of that startle effect. She started breathing and the blood started flowing. 
But that's that's part of the issue, right? How can a caregiver help somebody where they're in that mindset? Where in that uh, he is always listening. And listening skills is one of the things. Last year, I actually did an impromptu exercise on listening skills because I do that in my hypnosis trainings. And I realized some of these people weren't familiar with some of the uh, some of the uh, information I was giving out, the concepts. So I did a little impromptu uh, listening skills project. And at the end of the training, they said that was the best thing about the training. And I was like, well, I didn't even plan to do that. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's about listening. And that's what I was doing to the students. I was listening to them. And my mind said, we need to do something on listening skills. And it ended up being very helpful. So we're also flexible with the, with the students that are there to make sure they get something that they want that can give them a quality of value for being there. It's not a canned cookie cutter. Uh, training and I don't ever teach that way. Michael knows this, mm -hmm. and I learned that partially from Michael, I think, because when I became a trainer, it was after meeting Michael. You know, because it really is, it's like do, working with a client. You don't want to know before they walk in the door what you're going to do, in my opinion. You know, you might have an idea of the direction you might want to go, but be flexible enough, as Milton Erickson used to, used to say, spontaneous flexibility. I always thought that was the greatest phrase, you know, yeah. and, and it, to be flexible enough to listen and shift gears and go in a different direction if their <laughs> creative mind starts to offer you clues through that listening skills, through developing that sensory acuity, as we say, you know, and to learn to, to learn to adjust and go in a different direction. And you're if you if you trust your instincts and listen well, you're gonna you're gonna go in the direction for that day, that moment that they're with you to help them to get what they want. And that's the way I teach classes listening and, and Eric is very intuitive as well and he's a licensed psychologist the little different realm he comes from but he's got that ability to intuitively know in the moment enough to to go with what is presented and I, I just I get so much out of co-training with Eric through the last few years for that reason because he's always because he does come from a little different world than I came into this from and you weren't in show business, were you, Eric? I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> That's the world I came from. And, and But it's amazing how, you know, you learn things, not by, and I always love it when people say, I want to hang out with like-minded people. And I always think, well, one of you is redundant then. If you're, if everybody you're hanging out with is like-minded, what can you learn from anybody? And what can anybody learn from you? I know, I understand it's not quite that. <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the linguist that Michael has taught me to be, I hear those <laughs> kinds of phrases and I say, you know, I, I want to hang out with people that think really differently than I do. I might actually learn something by being open to other ideas. That's like why from I get with weirdos business. more and more often. I think that's helpful. <laughs> well, and I have to give a mutual compliment to Patty that I I get completely entranced when I'm working with her and, and I learn incredible amounts uh, with Patty. And, and I have to say this, this conference is amazing. I love going. And in fact, my, I'll just do a little fatherly bragging. My son and my daughter-in-law finished their doctorates in clinical psychology. They're in practice with me and they're coming this year because right. they want to get into it. So, um, and they're looking forward to training with Patty. So I can't speak highly enough about Patty and also this conference. Great. Yeah. Well, it oh. is going to be a, it is going to be a wonderful time indeed. And, uh, and uh, I, I'm sorry. Don't forget I, the Friday night social. The Friday night social. One of my favorites. And then, and then Peter Blum does the. Uh, the is he still going to do the sound vibration, the, the Tibetan bowls and things? He's I, got I, transonics someplace. Yes, he yes, 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 he is. He is. Yeah. He's he's actually teaching a workshop on that as well. A, a, yeah. a post conference workshop with that. Yes. So. And, good vibrations and and he speaking of good vibrations uh, so he's going to be a guest uh on the uh on the uh presenter series two weeks from tonight um and so is karen hand you perhaps have heard about her she's an interesting <laughs> lady uh what's what's the name of your topic again of my topic yeah Secret sauce for session success secret Ooh. sauce for session success look at all See, the things that, that are happening here Right. And so, and, I said, say that seven times really fast. Yeah. So give us for session success. Come on, we were entertainers. We can do that. Do you want to do you want to <laughs> off the tongue at uh, duels? <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, I, I just wanted to mention that because uh, then next week, I, I just uh, need to finish up this segment here. Next week, we're going to be talking with Sheila Granger about uh, uh, marketing and business operating system. 
We're also going to be talking with uh, uh, Sherry Gilbert about uh, doing smoking cessation for groups. So, if, by the way, if you know any groups that smoke, send them to Sherry Gilbert <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, because that's uh, that's what her thing is. Uh, and 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 what a great idea, by the way. And and, and isn't it interesting as as we're talking to you, uh, Patty and Patty and Eric, and and uh, closing out the segment. Two of the things that I think are the biggies for hypnotherapists traditionally have been, uh, historically, I would say, have been weight loss and smoking. You know, and somehow or another, uh, in, in the state of Florida, we were talking about what things are considered therapeutic, and, and weirdly enough, those two things are not kind of on the list. Uh, and yet, uh, these are medical issues, and it seems to me that the history of hypnosis is first medical, and then all these sort of other things were added to it later on. But, uh, but medical hypnosis is where it comes from uh, in, my, in my experience. So, uh, so pretty cool. And uh, we're looking forward to having you at the, at the conference. Uh, everybody sign up. There is, uh, uh, oh, <laughs> sure, yes, volunteering. Um, Will, Will, by the way, mentioned, uh, and it's in this segment, he, uh, he mentioned in the comments that there is a nice pilot program or a new pilot program coming out for Medicare, for general practitioners, and that they will want a hypnotist or mindfulness trainer as part of their protocols as well. Yeah. So another thing that uh, uh, that will become available to uh, the hypnotherapists, and particularly students of uh, Patricia and Eric Rosen, uh, who attend this medical hypnotherapy program at the IACT IMDHA conference in beautiful Orlando, Florida, April 24th through the 26th. Their program is actually Wednesday and then Thursday, the 22nd and 23rd of April. Beautiful time of the year here in Florida. If you're from someplace that's cold, you want to get down here and enjoy. Look at this. Just <laughs> yeah, yeah. Isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't it marvelous? So, uh, so come down and join us in Florida. So uh, Patty and Eric, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we are uh, at the end of our time, I'm afraid. And... Uh, but uh, we're looking forward to your to your program and seeing you in uh, in Orlando. So thanks for being with us. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Looking forward to seeing you both. Yay. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. So if you're on the camera, you can give a nice applause. Just yes, that. yes. Thank you, Will. So now, now we are going to uh, open up another microphone here, my goodness, for our good friend, Dr. Will Horton. Oh, he's done it himself because he knows how to handle those sort of things. That's right. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, so Karen, uh, who it's is not my first cowboy? rodeo. Yeah. Who, who, who is this cowboy? <laughs> hey, Dr. Will Horton. And I don't think he needs any more intro than that, Michael, but I think you said you wanted to do some introductions. What I do want to say before we get to that, if you don't mind, and you know, I don't want to tip him off anything. I'm going to sneak in with a question here before he gets started. But what I do want to say is just a reminder, you can get CEUs for this performance. You can go to the IACT, IMDHA, Mind Matters Forum, uh, and or even the website and get your CEUs for this. Even if you're watching the recording, you get CEUs for it. It'll also be posted on the virtual chapter for recordings. So I think those are the announcements that we need to make. We are recording, just know that. Yep, yep, and CEUs are available for yep. being here. So uh, yep. go to your association's website and claim your CEUs. And uh, we did announce our next week's folks. So so let me say hi to Will. First of all, Will is the one guy. The, the funny thing is, Will, and uh, we just uh, we just did this a couple weeks ago uh, when you were a guest on the Galaxy of the Stars. And I just mentioned that you're one of the folks that I have known in hypnosis since the days of ASCII characters on an internet screen uh, <laughs> and uh, and way back uh uh, in the in the early 90s or the late 80s or whenever the heck that was, and uh, so it's uh, it's always a pleasure to see you and to and to talk with you. Uh, Will is, by the way, a uh, well, a, one of the best uh, neurolinguistic programming trainers in the uh, in, in the planet in the galaxy, mind you. Uh, if you just believe that, just ask Will. He'll tell yes. you. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, he will. And, Don't and he, limit it to this galaxy. And he doesn't. And he doesn't lie. And he's always right. Uh, and he, he, is, he is a uh, licensed psychologist, and he is a certified alcohol and drug counselor, uh, as well as being a master hypnotist. And uh, gosh, 
Well, there's just a million things I could say about you, but I really want you to have an opportunity to talk about your program and stuff. And I know Karen did have a- I want to sneak this in. She was just jonesing to ask about. Yes, because okay. I, didn't, I didn't tip off Patty or Eric that we were going to ask, so I'm going to spring it on Will too. Your one hour. I want a little teaser, if you will, about the one hour that you're going to do on Saturday, neurobiology of NLP and hypnosis. Give us a tease on that. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, what I've- what I like lately too, like those of us been in this field for, for a while, you know, a little uh, mature, I like that term, like, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, Mr. Watson and myself, a lot of the stuff that we've said for years, you know, like uh, Mary Matching does this, this, and this, it was just kind of known, we knew that it worked. Now, because of the uh, uh, tra technology that we have, you know, and they discovered mirror neurons in the late 90s, and now they've discovered even more. So a lot of this stuff that we've taught for all these years, we know now is true, based in science, based in tracking. And you just had the wonderful thing on medical hypnosis, and some of the stuff that they've started to research with, you know, like uh, how the placebo effect actually works in the brain, based on imaging technology, you know, so, so what I want to talk about there is some of the neurobiology and, and uh, some of that in, in how NLP and hypnosis uh, can use that information. Uh, and I just read this really cool article about the four parts of the brain that are, that are really associated with uh, addiction and how we can hijack, they like that term lately, hijack that process, maybe to self, make yourself addicted to something you don't like, like exercise, things like that, using the same pathways. So I'm, I, this stuff is kind of cool. I can't tell you exactly what I'm going to talk there because I'm always reading new stuff on, uh, 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 you know, the, 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 the neurobiology and the neuro, you know, like a neuroplasticity in that. So yeah, I'm excited about that. Cool. And it was kind of, it kind of goes with one more thing. Now you got me started. It kind of goes with what uh, Dr. Rosen was saying too, like all the neurobiology of trauma that's actually stored in your body, right? Mm -hmm. It's not in your mind. It's in your body. You can't override it with your mind. That's why most trauma therapy does not just talk therapy does not work, you know, and that's coming out of uh, national association of uh, um, cognitive behavioral therapy. But so, I know that you're going to talk about NLP, but I just want to ask, in that event, couldn't we do some kind of swish pattern with that body part and with the mind? Yeah. Well, and, and, and you know, since we're, yeah, with, with, with the NLP, yeah, it's like, you know, it, and one reason, just to get started, one reason I fell in love with NLP, it works with the process, not the thoughts of it, you know. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I'm trained as a cognitive behavioral psychologist. I don't practice it because I like to do what works. Um, so I use hypnosis and NLP more than the cognitive behavioral therapy. And um, so what we could do, and when one of the things we found back in the early, when I got into it in the mid eight, early to mid eighties, is it was the first therapy that I found that actually took people into the things that they were working on, not pull back and disassociated, let's talk about it, you know, you know, let's talk about your mother. I mean, that sound too, you know, uh, uh, stereotypical, but all of that, it was the first process. It's like, okay, so you feel this, where in your body do you feel it? Like he said about the, somebody said about the headache thing, you know, where do you feel it? What color is it? Where is it at? What about this? Da, 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 da. Guess what? You move that stuff around and the subjective structure of it changes. So, okay, Michael, I hijacked that, so I'll hand it back to you, Gladwin. <laughs> okay. Well, I, in fact, uh, it was a perfect segue because we're already into the topic, but I just might mention for the viewing audience that the topic is, uh, Will is doing two days, the basics of NLP for hypnotists and therapists is Wednesday and Thursday, the two days uh, prior to the conference weekend, so that's the 22nd and the 23rd of April. So, uh, so you all want to be there for that. And Will, you, you've been telling us really what it was that sort of drew you to or, or that you found so attractive about NLP. Um, so the question that I was going to ask is similar and a little bit different and that, that is, well, so why are you doing this two-day essentials of NLP for hypnosis? Good question. Um, really, it boils down to when, and, and <clears throat> you, you can relate to this, Michael, uh, when 25, 30 years ago, if you took a hypnosis course, they never mentioned 
uh, a lot of the things like I access and Q submodalities, um, you know, strategies, some of the stuff that we were learning in NLP, it was separate in hypnosis. They weren't, uh, they didn't go together. Yeah. And I remember the first few hypnosis conferences I went to in the mid eighties, uh, there was a complete rift between hypnosis and NLP. They did not get along. If you went to an NLP conference, they made fun of the hypnotist. If you went to a hypnotist conference, I remember Gil Boyne, I'll use names, Gil Boyne, Jerry Kine, uh, Al Krasner and them going like, oh, that NLP, it's a bunch of crap, da, 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 da. Then you go to the other side, the NLP, those hypnotists are idiots. They don't know what they're doing, right? And it was two tracks. And over time, it began to merge. So now it's it, most people that's taken hypnosis training in the last 10 years Probably, I can't say because it depends who's teaching it, they get exposed to eye accessing cues, submodalities, rep systems, maybe some light strategy stuff. So they already have a lot of the basics. And, you know, I was the guy that got in a lot of trouble with a lot of the old hypno NLP organizations because <clears throat> I started doing the, uh, I started, at first I shortened my training to five days, then I took it down to like, or six days, then I took it to five. And usually now it's four or five for a certification training. And back then it was, uh, it got up to like 20 something days of training. Some yeah. of the trainings were very long. 27 for me. Yeah. And, and that's great if you walk in Tabla Rusa and you don't have a background in it. You know, even when I took the, the first NLP training, I was already now called drug counselor. So I'm sitting there going, a lot of this is kind of redundant to me. You know, they, they're teaching some very basic like therapy kind of skills. So anyway, going back to why am I doing this as a two day training? Most of the people that will come to something like a hypnosis conference, and I've taught this two-day format for like, um, you know, the, the, the chapter meetings and places like that, because they're already hypnotists. I don't have to introduce the concept of the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, the conflict between them, the critical factors, what is an ab reaction, all that. They, they probably, ought, they should have a good working knowledge of it. So what I can do in, in, in two days is... Uh, and I know you've kind of done this too, It's just give people some of the techniques and tips that they're going to actually run into in a traditional broad-based hypnosis training if you, or a hypnosis practice. You know, you do weight loss, you do smoking, you probably do some sports, maybe a little bit of, you know, we can't use the term anxiety, a little bit of nervousness, things like that, a little bit of addictions. What are some of the, ba the main techniques people can take and understand? And much like our to me, what a good basic hypnosis training also gives you, just like the good NLP basics, is, you know, after the two days or after a four day or after your basic hypnosis, if you can pick up one of the journal magazines, uh, one of the, uh, somebody writes an article with a hypnosis or an NLP technique, if you can pick it up, read through it and go, I can do this, then I've done my job. If yeah. you've gotten the, you know, it's kind of like we say in the martial arts, all a black belt means is I understand the basics enough to break these things down if nobody's around to show me. You know, I can like read it, look at it, and go, okay, I think I can do that. So that's why I started doing it. And time is valuable for most of us. If you're a private practitioner, you got to take time off. Uh, if you're still working a job as you're transitioning into being a therapist, a hypnotist, you know, it, it, it's time is valuable, mm -hmm. right? So come in, get the highlights. And then if you want more as you know, Patricia and Dr. Rosen said, then there's ways to get more training via online, via this. And my real goal of it too is that, and also too with all this stuff on YouTube and all this free stuff, you'll be able to watch it and understand it. And that's, so I, you could do it fast and effective in a format. And it's always fun to do them at a hypnosis conference because again, it's a bunch of somewhat like-minded people but in a broad base, because we had people that have different thoughts about all kinds of stuff. Sure. Well, so so here's here's the thing. You you know you've been doing this for uh, about thirty five years or so, and and uh, so between between God between you and me and Karen and 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 uh, and uh, and Patty Scott and and the folks on this call, we've got like four centuries worth of experience. <laughs> you know, it's, it's it's amazing, and. And and we've all seen some changes, right? We've we've seen a, a lot of things. In fact, what I what I remember is what I got involved with before it was before I was doing hypnosis or neurolinguistic programming. Uh, I had been involved with EST, and before that, I had been involved in some other things. And and I and I came through a channel that I would call the human potential movement. And now, 
uh, and now, you know, we go to conventions and conferences and it's, it's, it's all of these different things and it's about marketing and it's about the internet and it's about uh, the, the whole landscape has changed so dramatically. So what are, what are some of the things that you've really noticed as being significant changes in hypnosis in this, in this period of time or okay. NLP? Well, in, in honor of Est, if you want, when we come to my training, we'll lock the door so you can't go pee. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That, that's an inside joke for those of us that know S, the original, the old school. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, the, the information got um, uh, handed out much more easily, obviously, because of the internet, because of all the uh, easy access to information. Like they say, the, the brilliant thing about the internet is access to information. The, the challenges and the damage of the internet is access to information. Sometimes because people will watch if I've had people go, oh, I, I don't need to take any training. You know, I've watched three or four hypnosis videos and an NLP video, you know, online and I'm I'm good to go. Right. So there's there's that. So but I've seen us be go back and become more uh, uh, embraced by uh, certain aspects of the medical community, not all aspects of the medical community, uh, but a lot of it. And I think that's because in like when I, I posted that thing about uh, Medicare is coming out with a pilot program for general MD, general practitioner MDs to put together a health and wellness kind of thing for their, ma uh, for their managed care patients where they're going to have to have certain things on staff. One of them, because I looked at it, would be like a mindfulness or a meditation coach and that they will have to be on staff. Not that you're going to work there and bill insurance. That'll go through however the medic managed care. And when I got to talk to the guy from that one managed care company, because I happened to be a, a friend of mine's office, and he goes, well, they probably foresee the day in the future where this will be how most insurance companies operate, if insurance still goes on in its current format. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm seeing it be embraced because, you know, if, if a, as we see the, the people starting to wake up, that it's easier to keep people healthy than to wait till they're damn near dead and try to fix them. Right. And the, you know, so we're, and hypnosis is great because now too, I love all the studies coming out about, you know, the placebo and the nocebo effect, you know, and how effective it is. It always leads me to my favorite quote, which is if you overdose on, on a placebo, do you only think you're dead uh, <laughs> yes. and you might die. Right. And, and so, so yeah, I've seen a, I've seen a change and I think now we're in the balance of, you know, the, the, the convergence of hypnosis, NLP, Reiki, EFT, a lot of these things are kind of get merged into, you know, this, this holistic healthcare movement, which I think is a good thing. Um, the only fear I have of it on the flip side, you could tell I'm a Libra, on the other hand, uh, is <clears throat> then people don't, don't get enough knowledge in one area to, to really become a master at it. And, and so I see it starting to change. I see it growing. I see seeing, seeing us being more embraced. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, Will, how knowledge and more knowledge and more knowledge can make you less than. Oh, I don't think it'll make you less than, but if, uh, wh what is, what is, there's a reason if, if I wanted my knee, if I was an NFL player and I wanted my knee rebuilt, I'm probably going to go to one of three doctors in the United States. And that's all that they do. They could do other things, but they get really, really good at one thing. And then they can do the other things and they'll do the adjunct. But, you know, part of that, I think it's coming back around. Um, you could be a jack of all trades, but then you're a master of none. Not that you don't understand all this. And I think it's all cool, but, you know, and then you can also get lost into never stopping taking classes till you finally open your practice. Wait a minute though, let me, let me stick with that knee replacement analogy for a second. Well, I'm gonna move it to a hip replacement analogy because I know a little bit about that, okay? I, I, because I need one. I haven't had it done yet, but I've done a lot of research on it. And you can get it done from the front or you can get it done from the side, right? The side, they cut through muscle. The front, they don't. 
Now, it depends on who you talk to. The people who are still doing that surgery on the side will tell you, oh, you've got to do it this way because the front has this problem and this problem and this problem. The people who go through the front will say, oh, man, you don't ever want to do that side thing because they're cutting through muscle and it's so terrible. Whatever you do, you're going to sell that thing, right? If you right. had advanced training, you're going to sell that. If you haven't had that advanced training, you're going to say, hey, the people who are still doing that old trick just haven't had the advanced training. So what, I, what I'm saying is you're going to sell from your position of expertise, no matter what it is. Yes. If you only know NLP, you're going to sell the virtues of NLP. If you only know hypnosis, you're going to sell the virtues of hypnosis. If you know a little bit about both, you can utilize what works best with the client who walks into your office. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then throw in the other things. <laughs> right. Right. So, yes, specialty. I think I understand specializing, but I also understand knowing a lot in the specialty that you've chosen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think that's what you're doing with your course. Cool. I think I'm yeah. interested in your course. Well, by the yeah. way, so, so let's, so let's tighten in on that a little bit. What, well, so essential skills, there's, there's the, the phrase that I'd love for you to unpack. What, what are essential skills? Well, I think, uh, there are several, uh, greatest hits that, that a, a good work, a, a hypnotist should be very familiar with. Right. Um, and some of, they may have been exposed to it already in a slightly different format. So what we'll do in the training is kind of unpack it. But something like, and you kind of mentioned it, or Karen did something like the what I would the visual squash or parts therapy, right? And when that first really got cooking, you know, it was the visual squash. Then they developed parts therapy, and now there's a whole therapy around parts therapy, which is kind of like the visual squash, uh, but because it has to do with the conscious subconscious conflict. It, it's very simple technique. And when you unpack it and you begin to un understand that essential part of it, then you can take it in different directions. So that would be like an essential skill. Another one would be the classic new behavior generator that a lot of us love, right? And mm -hmm. I remember when they taught it at, at Bandler taught it when I was there and everybody's like, isn't this great? And I go, it's called theater of the mind from Maxwell Maltz, but let's not go down this path. You know, we'll, we'll say they invented it. They, they slicked it up and made it easier to do. Because again, what NLP did was take a lot of these techniques and broke it down to make it easy, easier to replicate. Yeah. So, you know, so like when they studied a Milton Erickson or, you know, uh, 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 Maxwell Maltz and some of the things that he had in there, they condensed it down and made it easy to duplicate. And I always throw Maxwell Maltz in there because he's the unaccredited uh, one of the big guys that helped start NLP, in my opinion, because sure, sure. they studied his techniques. So things like that, new behavior generator. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of my other classics is, uh, that I love is the phobia technique, because you can run with that in several different directions, mm -hmm. from mending a broken heart to helping people retire. I, when I first moved to Florida, I didn't realize how valuable that little technique would be to help people uh, comfortably retire, especially if they got out thrown out of their career early like you know we're we're uh, that that we see when companies downsize you know you're using theater of the mind for that no that i use the phobia technique oh, oh, oh okay yeah yeah to so, help change it so so will you mentioned earlier that that there was a time at least and and i think there's still some of that around when when people thought that nlp was one thing and hypnosis was something else uh, and so every once in a while, I'll have a person that's talking to me about something and they're a hypnotist and, and they'll say, you know, what do I do in a situation like this? And, and I might refer to something from NLP, maybe something like the phobia cure. And I'd say something about, well, you know, you might want to consider this particular pattern, this is something they were, they were aware of. Uh, and they say, well, so you mean I stop doing the hypnosis and then, and then I do the NLP and then, and then do I do an induction again after that? Uh, so, so, um, so what we're finding is, of course, they're, they're not two different things. And the question is really about how to weave NLP into the hypnotic work that you're already doing and, or how to use hypnosis in order to make the NLP more powerful and effective, um, rather than one and then the other, right? Right. And yeah, I'm always amused. Somebody goes, so when do you do hypnosis? When do you do NLP? You know, it, they look at it, it's a binary choice, right? <laughs> and um, and, or somebody say, NLP is a great tool for your toolbox. One of the things I never back off of, because I firmly believe it, NLP is not a tool. 
It is the toolbox <laughs> that once you understand how to use it, you could be a cognitive behavioral therapist. You could do uh, 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 rational motive therapy. You could do five path. You could do whatever that is would fit in an NLP framework because it's how to gather information, how to practice your rapport skills, how to listen, you know, and, and uh, another thing NLP is not given the really good credit for is the whole brief therapy model in psychology. If Dr. Rosen was in, I'd ask him now that actually comes, that was really pressured by NLP coming on the scene going, well, what, what do you mean? It takes six months to get therapeutic relationship established with your client before you can start therapy. You give me six sessions. We'll do some, we'll do some, I don't want to say damage, but we'll do some work with the guy. So the whole rapid therapy, you know, fast transformation therapy has its um, <clears throat> foundations in NLP. And in fact, there's one running around. I see it's real big in Florida. It's other places. It's supposedly all this breakthrough stuff. And I listened to a lot of it and I'm like, wow, this is like a basic NLP training from the late nineties with a lot of, uh, much more clinical words thrown in, you know, rather, rather than just regular English, they would, you, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, counter. Yeah. The, they would use the, 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 the psychological terms. So, so yeah. So yeah, they, they go together, you know, from how to gather information and, and all that. But just what you were saying, if, one believes that it will take six months to develop rapport, then by God, it will. Oh yeah. If you can, if you can change that limiting belief to rapport can be built. <laughs> I mean, here's a great quote, a way to persuade somebody that the research shows that in an interview situation, the, the boss who is interviewing a prospective client can make their decision in the first three seconds of you walking in the door, their decisions already made before any words are spoken or anything else has been has happened. That's what the research shows, that it really in the first three seconds of the encounter is when a decision is made. So you've got three seconds to build rapport. You don't have six months. And if you go into it with the frame of believing that it has to be instant or it has to be quick or it can be done quickly, then it can be done quickly. Yeah, right? well, and, and there's two things too. It's like, um, a lot of that old therapeutic model was built when people had the insurance that wouldn't question once a week for six, six, right. or seven months, <laughs> yeah. you know, that you didn't have to do the follow-up notes, but I love your thing about the instant thing. Patricia and I can relate to when you have to audition uh, when she was singing more and you have to audition, you kind of knew the, the second note, whether you got the job or not. I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> it doesn't take six months or, six hours or a whole song. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to do all 16 bars. They've made their decision. Yeah, right. Good analogy and way to <laughs> talk about that. Don't you yeah. So, so, Will, you mentioned a number of, of uh, sort of standard techniques from NLP, things that people know about, like the phobia cure and the new behavior generator and things like that. Uh, are there any kind of new techniques that uh, well, yeah, you come along? Because you seem to come up with new stuff all the time. I, I, I see you online. Yeah, no, well, and... Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I got too much time on my hands. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm coming up with different, like, you know, because when you look at how it was founded by Bandler and Grinder, uh, who studied those other guys, and then we go back and we look at, like, you know, Milton Erickson, you know, but he goes, like, we need, you know, what a, who trained Milton Erickson in hypnosis, right? You know, who trained uh, Dave Elman in hypnosis? We could go all the way back, right? Uh, we could go to uh, Orman McGill, who trained Orman McGill, Uh they were, they were experimenting, they were trying things, and they saw if it worked, they duplicated it, and they made it better, and they kept going. And so one of the things I've started to do is try to develop some new, newer techniques, mm -hmm. uh, because you and I talked at one of the conferences that we're still doing the best of the 1980s, yeah. right? Some of those essential ones I talked about have been around for a while. That's great, but I use my martial arts analogy, a front kick is a front kick is a front kick, mm -hmm. right? But sure. can we learn how to do a spinning back kick? Can we learn some of the, the other stuff? So what are some of the, you get the basics, let's learn some of the, because uh, the, the people that are learning from us are going to take it to the next level. Hopefully they're going to keep going. And so I'm trying to come up with different things based on how we think different now than we did in the 80s, based on technology, based on some of the information we have. You know, it, when we're exposed to this information uh, subconsciously through like, 
how the internet works and how all this stuff works, we can come up with faster, better techniques. So I've been playing with things like the magic mirror, the hall of the hall of the, the hall of mirrors, the yes no technique, all these other things no. that that are, that are a lot of fun, you know, and and well, all and going back to some of the basics. Well, that's really so cool because I mean, one of the things that often people will ask, and and I, I love it when I see this in a, in a chat room or something because people say, well, what is NLP doing lately? And I'm like, well, who exactly are you talking about? What you know? What is who 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 is that even? Who is that address? So the thing is that NLP, as I when you said this about it being the toolbox rather than a tool, I think that's that's a lovely metaphor um, because NLP, as I understand it, is the study of the structure of subjective experience. The noun there is is that it is a study, uh, and the interesting thing is nobody seems to be studying NLP except those innovators that are saying, "What else can we do with this?" and 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 uh, and so uh, so kudos to you for for that. That's uh, absolutely what uh, what I think needs to happen. Well, yeah, and I, I was watching. I forget where I saw it. And um, like, here's a quick one people can use. I call it the flip, which is we all have a part of our minds where we store information that used to be true, but now is not. Used to be true, now is not. Yeah, uh, I used to live in Indiana. Now I live in Florida. In fact, I used to live in one part of Florida. Now I live in another part of Florida. So my brain understands that it's true. I cannot deny I lived in Indiana or wherever, but I don't live there now. What if we use how my brain is encoding that information to put a behavior I want to leave behind? So rather than like chew it over my head for six months, throw it into the part of my brain where it's like when I lived in Indiana. I liked it. It was fine. I could be in downtown Chicago in 45 minutes. I liked it. But guess what? I like sunshine. So I like where I'm at now. So sure. your brain has the part of your brain where it used to be true and now is not. And then you have things that are true for you now. And within that, how long did it take you to get comfortable with the things that are true for you now? So when you get a new phone number, how long does it take for you to get comfortable with that? Once you've unco this is the kind of stuff I think I like to do. Okay, now you have that, you can, you have this basically code that seems to transfer across people pretty well because we all have that kind of uh, uh, universal experience, as we would say in NLP, that we could relate to getting a new phone number or even just a new, a new phone. And then um, a friend of mine came up with a cool technique about uh, the technology. He, I forget what he's calling it. He's still playing with it. But how to uh, uh, change your thinking based on technology, right? Because how quickly something becomes obsolete and how quickly can you let go of it? Are you going to be one of these people who are still carrying a goddamn flip phone? <laughs> if you are, I, maybe I can't help you. And that's, I heard him say that to somebody, right? And they're like, what do you mean? He goes, you got to adapt. It's all about adaptation. You know, when I got my iPhone 10, it, it still drives me crazy. There's no home button, right? And, but I'm adapting. And, these, and technology is making us more adaptable if you use it. Well, so let me ask you about that. There's a technique phone. in there somewhere. <laughs> let me ask you about that phone. Does that have every application that you will ever want on it? Mm. So if you come up with something new that you want, you're just going to go to the app store and search for it, right? Right. And if you and, find that app, you're going to install it into your phone, right? Right. If, if that takes the place of some app, app that is no longer necessary, you're going to go and you're going to hover over it. And you're going to allow that. Delete to it. Yeah, and you're going to delete it, right? Yeah, I don't use, I, I just delete, I don't use Skype on my phone. It drives me batshit crazy, right? So I deleted it. So why can't we use that analogy? And people understand it. They do, and they adapt to it very quickly. And they understand that sometimes you have outdated apps on your phone that just sit there and they use energy and they do all sorts of things that aren't necessary anymore. When no. you discover that it's not necessary anymore, you just go in and you delete it or you change it or you upgrade it. You go back to the app store and you find something better. Now, right. sometimes when I delete an app, I have to stop for a minute and think, now, just why exactly did I have that application on there in the first place? What must have happened to me somewhere a long time ago <laughs> that caused me to download that particular application? Was it your mother, Michael? Was it your mother? <laughs> it, it usually was. <laughs> And I want to know what kind of hypnosis training she had because she leveled some absolutely phenomenal suggestions. Did she not do that? Yes. That post hypnotically have stayed with you all of these years. And she was entirely unqualified. 
<laughs> I mean, look, this is the result. So what can I say? So, uh, so Will, I, I understand you have some kind of a, a special bonus for people who sign up for your program. Oh, yeah. Uh, people that sign up early, uh, if when, when they sign up, get, get in touch with me. You know, I'm easy to find Facebook. You could ask IMDHA or IAC. Just they'll send you my, they'll give you my contact info. Let me know you signed up and I'm going to give you a choice of one or two. You could choose one or two uh, uh, online programs that I have. Right. One of them in the process of updating my addiction program, but I'll get you the one I have now. Uh, so if you want to study addictions uh, or one of the other ones that I have. So to, to, so you can follow up on the information. And for people that listen to this, if they get in touch with me and let me know they listen to this online, uh, th let me know and I'll send you a copy of one of my books, uh, uh, the Quantum Psychology book. Right. Well, I'm here live. I'm here live. Can I get that quantum psychology book? Yeah, let okay. me know. So, <laughs> so, so by the way, uh, Will, how uh, how can people get in touch with you? Um, well, usually you could call your local police department because my picture's somewhere on the wall. Uh, oh, tough crowd. Whew, I'm here till Friday. Uh, it's uh, NFNLP stands for the National Federation of Neurolinguistic uh, Programming. And that, that's about the third longest uh, continuous NLP group out there, by the way. You still have the society. Oh. Uh, the American board's gone through some morphs. So, uh, and and uh, NLP comprehensive is pretty much gone. Uh, so, you know, how do you become an old timer? You just hang around and don't die. Um, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. But it's been around quite a while. So you can get in touch with nfnlp.com or uh, 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 my uh, best email is Dr. Will Horton, D R W I L L H O R T O N, at gmail.com. And I'll get you a copy of that book. It'll just be an ebook, you know, like a PDF. Uh, I'm too cheap to send the hard copy. Um, and, you know, even though my wife loves hard copies. You know. Well, will you have your books at the conference? Yes, I'm ordering extra ones. Yes. Yes. And all, and, yes. And so. Do you have in your head a list of all the books that you're going to bring? Uh, mind control, uh, persuasion engineering, uh, or not, that's Bandler's thing. Uh, the secret psychology of persuasion, um, the quantum psychology, the addiction book that I have, the uh, ultimate fat loss for you book that's just being released this month, uh, and uh, habits for success, my new book, mm -hmm. the other new book. <clears throat> And by the way, one person on the call, Miss Mary Beth, took my training a while ago. So I, I'm seeing some names I know. And I know other people have sat through some of my stuff. So I like the two-day format because it's fast. You get the highlights. <clears throat> and then people can decide what do they want to do with it. You yeah. know, what, what, where do they want to go? Do they want to go study timeline? Do they want to go study this? More parts therapy with it. So it's a great, it's, it's a great intro overview. Yeah. Yeah. You know what the interesting thing I found out about that, Will, though, is just an introduction to some of these techniques is often enough to get somebody started. And if they have the foundational level, they can upgrade their hypnosis practice so much with just those essentials that you're talking about. And they may not want to do a deep dive into NLP, but having those essentials will upgrade their practice. And and, and, and we're going to yeah, and we're going to spend a couple hours on uh uh, hypnotic language, how to use waking hypnosis language. Nice. So, Speaking uh, my language. <laughs> nice. So if there are any questions, by the way, we are, I don't know, I have about six minutes left. If yeah. you've got some questions you'd like to ask Will, by, the, by all means, either raise your hand in the participants um, area. And, or and yes, I really do have horses. <laughs> so those aren't rental horses. <laughs> you you rent them every day for the video. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or like they do on the, you know, you know how they bust people when they're taking the selfies and it's all bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've seen you in your cowboy hat, but do you walk around in chaps? Only on Friday night, but that's, let's not go there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's one of those after hour things Patricia likes. <laughs> well, we, do have, we, have, we do have that Friday night. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully by the conference, <clears throat> excuse me. I'll be wear, able to wear my cowboy boots again. I've been able to wear cowboy boots for four months. Wow. Do we want to ask why? 
the torn Achilles tendon. Oh, oh, oh okay. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> wow. Listen, um, by the way, uh, for, and for, forgive me for doing this, but uh, Patricia Scott, you are still on here. Uh, and we are just uh, a couple minutes away from the end. And as we're wrapping up, I realize that uh, I, uh, I, got, uh, I got Will's contact information for everybody. And, uh, and I apologize, but I didn't, uh, I didn't ask how people can get in touch with you. So open up your microphone, Patty, and tell us uh, how, can people, how can people get in touch with you. Oh, no, no you let me open up your mic. There it is. Oh, there it is. There it is. Oh, wait. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Ironically, Patty, Michael, was, just, Patty was just asking a question confusion. about how to do more training. So, Patty, while you're on, you can ask that, too. It's a confusion technique, but that's that doesn't work with me because I start out confused. Okay. <laughs> uh, uphypnosis.com. UP, like, look up in the air. Up. Everything's up with me. Uphypnosis.com. That's right. all they need right. now. And, and, and Patty, go ahead and ask Will your question because you wrote it. Yeah, Will, uh, because I've taken a lot of trainings with, with you since 28 years ago, and it's always so valuable. I was wondering for people who might want to go ahead and get certified with you in NLP, uh, would this training be a precursor or would it help them like? Oh, yeah, yeah. What I've been doing yeah. lately, yes, good question. What I've been doing lately for people to take the two day, I just did one, and several of the people there go, they want to learn more. <clears throat> so they, that I, uh, I have it on home study, which is the cool term, right? Uh, used, to, used to be uh, video cassettes. Jerry Kine got me, got me <laughs> to do my first home study NLP course. And I, I love telling this story because a lot of us people here remember Jerry Kine. Is he goes, but Will, and he does this. If you do, <laughs> if you do this, they're going to fucking hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I got letters from all the big wigs in NLP when I started doing the first home study. But especially if you take a two-day live class and you get the hands-on experience, then you can watch the videos and you go, okay, I get it. You know, yeah. okay, I get it. That's right. That's right. Because I took a couple of NLP trainings before I got your DVD set. Thank you, Jerry Kine. And that's when I said, I get it. Yeah, so yeah, so because I still do some um, certification trainings, but I'm really starting to like this two day format to tell you the truth. <laughs> you know, and then have people do some follow ups, maybe, you know, come in. Of course, you know, when I lived up by where you were, Miss, uh, Miss Karen, I would do uh, two and a half days, then a few weeks later, do two and a half day follow up. So, right. Well, all right. Uh, we are uh, at the end of our time, so I, I need to just make a couple quick uh, wrap-up announcements. And uh, and Will, if you and Patty will hang out just for a minute, then we'll be able to give you the. the well, the wait. Great... Did Will give you, Will? Did you give your contact information? I'm sorry. I know Patty yeah, yeah. did, but would you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was drlove.com. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> NLP has a bad enough reputation. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> So let's just remind everybody, Karen, CEUs are available. Go to IAC IMDHA website, claim your time, tell them you- Even uh, if you're watching the recording, you get CEUs. Yeah, yeah. Because later on, when you're asking yourself, now what did they talk about? Well, you'll have a chance to, uh, to check it out again and make sure that your memory was correct. Uh, next week again is going to be Sheila Granger. Her topic is the successful hypnopreneur's business and marketing operation system. That I love the word hypnopreneurs. I think yeah. that's pretty good. And uh, Sherry Gilbert's smoking cessation for groups. So uh, please be there. It's going to be a great time. And uh, one week from now. And uh, meanwhile, let uh, let Patty and uh, Will know that you uh, appreciated them uh, being on the call with us. And uh, I, well, I can open up your microphones and you can uh, you can say uh, good night. So say good night. We'd like the cacophony of good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Karen. Thank you. Thanks, Will. See y'all at the expo. See you, See you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night.